Good morning. I'll try that again. Good morning. Uh, it is Tuesday, May 28th, and this is the Elementary School Building uh, Subcommittee or Sustainability Subcommittee meeting. And maybe we could then, well, I, first I'll make sure that all my, my subcommittee members can be heard. Uh, Rupert. I hear you loud and clear, sir. <laughs> and we can kind of hear you. <laughs> <laughs> You're there, muted again. There, there, you uh, there. Now, if I hold the mic right in front of my mouth, I think you can hear me better. Yes. Yeah. Kathy? Yep, here. And Bruce? Yep, I'm here. Great. So it looks like Shelly and Jacob did not receive an invite from Angela. So I'm going to just send them the agenda. Okay. And they should be able to join. Okay. Kathy, you'll just have to keep an, an eye out for them. Um, I will. Give me one second to do that. And then I will pull up the agenda. And Tim was right. There's lots of Tim Poopers today. Yeah. Uh, Ale, <laughs> Jared, and Irma are all Tim, which is really unfortunate. Uh, okay. So let me see whether. Uh, so up in the. I can up in if people can see up in your upper right corner, if you hover an arrow, there's the little dots and you can change your name. Oh, Ali just did that. I think um, folks are doing it. Uh, look at that. We suddenly got. Uh, and that's Jacob. Yeah, and you have a couple more of me's now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Jacob and Shelly, could you go to the three dots above your faces and change? There you go. And there's only two of me. There goes all the fun for this meeting. <laughs> <laughs> this would have been very exciting. <sighs> Waiting for AI to be able to simulate your voice so that I could really get the full effect. There you go, the full Tim, right? Hey, Tim, what do you think? I don't know, Tim. What do you think? <laughs> still have, we only have one of me now, but still two Tim. Yeah, sure, yeah sure. Tim thinks no one wants that. <laughs> I've always wanted to clone myself. This is perfect. There you go. Do we, do we think everybody that we're expecting is here? Everybody we're expecting is here. Very good. I'm happy to yes. say. Thank you, everybody, you for chiming in. So, um, I am happy to pull up the agenda, Jonathan, whenever you're yeah, ready. Yeah, I am ready. But you have to enable screen sharing. Uh, oh, might be... Kathy does that. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Here we go. So, by the way, it's been a while, right? I think we last met on Halloween, if you can believe it. But... Um, a lot has moved forward. Um, we actually just submitted, um, uh, Denisco just submitted on behalf of the um, building committee, the 90% construction document submittal and pretty much everybody on this in this meeting had some role in that. So thank you all. We're cruising along um, with the anticipation of going to bid in June. And so what we're doing here is kind of following up and closing the loop on a bunch of items. So just quickly, we're gonna talk about the plug load analysis, um, which is in the packet if you haven't seen it. Um, we're gonna get an update on the status of the energy model. I'm gonna just say a couple of words um, about how the geothermal and PV is being bid. Um, there, we wanted to give the folks in this committee an update on a discussion about the lobby display of energy information that Shelley and Jacob and I have been discussion, discussing with Kathy and then items not anticipated. So any questions about that before I take it down? Nope, oh, that's good. And we have okay. about two hours for this. We're scheduled from 11 to one. Yeah. Okay, so I am gonna turn the floor over to Denisco and TT to talk about the plug load analysis and what we have learned. 
Yeah, and I am very quickly going to just introduce it and in saying that um, the for both the total energy model and the plug note, the numbers are coming in very close to what we've been targeting and anticipating all along. And then Dr. Thomas Eddy, our team is here to basically describe in more detail the process and how things went and where the variations that did occur from uh, what we've been anticipating or modeling all along uh, sort of showed up. Uh, but uh, the headline is where, where we want to be, and I will let them take it away. Yeah. Mike, do you want to drive on this one? I want to pull up the slides. Hi, everyone. Ali with Red Light Studio Hi. working with, with TT on this one. I think I know all of you. Um, and I think uh, TT will be covering the plug load piece. Um, the slides, to be clear, are meant to be, you know, brief so that we give an overview. And if there are more questions, we can get, there's a bunch of backup slides so we can get into a lot more detail. Uh, but the idea is to, you know, just to give you a sense of, of where we are and um, in both aspects. Hold on just one second, I'm pulling it up. Uh... Okay, maybe we could just do a, a just a quick reintroduction. So um, I am Irmak Turan with Thornton Tomasetti, the sustainability uh, consultants on the project. Um, uh, here with uh, Rebecca Romlo and Don Liu are also here from our team, and we've been working in collaboration with Ale Manchaka of Airlit Studios on um, on the energy modeling and sustainability um, approach to the project. Um, and Ollie's actually gonna take the lead on this presentation. So I'll hand it off to you quickly. Ollie. Yeah, so super briefly, I think everyone's familiar with this, but we have three main driving goals uh, in terms of energy for this project, achieving net zero energy, meeting the 25 uh, EUI for mass save incentives, and then maximizing energy points wherever we want. Um, and um, if you go to the next, then, you know, we'll get a little bit in the plug load study. And just as a reminder, plug load study, plug load studies are, are extremely useful. Um, so it's great that this project actually went through them. Uh, when we when we run an energy model, oftentimes we use default values uh, for for equipment loads um, and uh, unless there is more information about them. And so, you know, sometimes for lighting, for instance, we, at the beginning, we might begin with default values, but as the design evolves, we actually get more information on what those values are gonna be. For plug loads, that number tends to be a little bit more, you know, um, again, we tend to defer to defaults much more frequently, um, just because plug loads are very, very hard to predict. Uh, and they're very specific from case to case, from some, you know, from project to project, and they're quite challenging to come up with. And so if one wants to dig a little deeper into what the plug loads might be, which is super important for, for you know, for schools that are aiming that really, you know, not exceeding that 25, not only th that 25 AUI, not only in the modeled, but also in the predicted or in the actual, right? A plug load study can give us a much better sense of where we are. Um, this is particularly important these days when we are switching, you know, kitchen equipment is changing so much because we used to have a lot of equipment that was gas. Um, and, um, and, and so in terms of electricity demand, when we're sizing our PVs, et cetera, et cetera, um, it's much more important to understand uh, for various equipment typologies, what is the anticipated energy use. Um, and so that's just a brief, you know, a, 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 an overall background as to why one would do a plug load study and why we did that one for this particular project. Again, plug load studies um, can sometimes lead to, you know, to very eye-opening conclusions. Oftentimes they confirm where we were, but allow us to refine, you know, identifying, well, there there might have been a little bit more plug loads in the kitchen and in less and, you know, in other areas, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what the study did. And so, Ermac, if you want to just give an overview of, of what we did. Again, there's far more details. I understand that you have the actual study with all the entire table of all the plug loads that were accounted for. So happy to go through that if you want. But um, we'll stick to the, to the main conclusions for now. Yeah, so just to, I'm happy to hear that um, hopefully it 
all or most people on the on the call um, have a copy of the memo summarizing the plug load study. Um, the the approach, so as all I mentioned, the idea is to move from using um, sort of generalized assumed inputs for the plug loads and uh, the equipment to being uh, more project specific. And the success of a plug load study depends um, wholly on the input, the information that we receive from the team, um, from the uh, and, and everyone who's involved. And in this case, we received great information. So I think that that, that was really um, helpful in the process. The process that we go through is uh, we essentially uh, develop uh, share a, um, a spreadsheet to develop an inventory of all the equipment that's gonna be used in specific spaces within the project. Um, and then we ask the, those who um, know about the equipment in, in those spaces, um, to provide information of, about specific um, equipment that's going to be installed. And so in this case, we we uh, gathered information from school representatives, from uh, the, you know, the uh, AV subconsultants, other project consultants, um, and worked very closely with Danisco to gather all the information um, needed. And to give you a summary, overall summary of where we are with the, where the plug load study landed, this table uh, shows you uh, we get there's three rows. We have the general school plug loads um, on the first row. The second row is the kitchen plug loads. Um, as Ollie mentioned, kitchen equipment um, can be is an important uh, area to consider, and so we've listed that separately. And then we we've as a summary shown you what the overall um, total plug load uh estimates are um and the first column on the left is what we were using in the 100 percent dd energy model which was issued back in september um this is based on the more generalized assumptions um the middle column shows us what the plug load study resulted in in terms of um a overall load for these three different uh, categories, and then we can see where the where the changes are um, in the right column. So what we found, or what the plug load study estimated, is that the um, the general school plug loads, so those used in the classrooms and other uh, school spaces, um, the plug load yielded slightly lower um, loads for those spaces. Um, in the kitchen, uh, based on the equipment schedule we received, uh, the overall kitchen plug load was slightly higher than that which we assumed in the um, in the DD model. And then when we put everything together, uh, we found that the overall plug load assumption was was about was 0.2 um, kBTU per square foot uh, higher than what we had assumed in in DD. Uh, which is, you know, within a couple percentages of what the DD assumption was. So um, as Ollie noted, it, this study both allowed us to refine, but also to confirm um, the relevance of the numbers that we've been using in DD. So happy to answer any questions about this. Um, yeah, I think this is this. I think it was a it was a very fruitful exercise for this particular project to really hone in on on what we expect the equipment um, and the loads within the building to be. Um, yeah, throughout. Bruce, you have questions. I presume. Uh, yes, I've got a couple of questions and a, a couple of comments. Uh, I just want to uh, first of all, uh, of course, um, I understand that the. Uh, the plug load analysis is delivered in kilowatt hours and uh, um, uh, and so forth. But the, uh, the what we're looking at is is delivered. Uh, uh, the comparison is in kbtus per square foot per year and so forth. So it's a a bit of a, a a mental lift to make those transpositions in my head. But I understand why, of course, because it's an all electric building, and I understand that the convention is to discuss things in kbtus per square foot rather than kilowatts. Or kilowatt hours per square meter, which if we're in Europe, it'll all be much easier. Um, it would be, I agree. 
Well, we can thank. I vote for that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Any event, uh, um, I wanted to observe that um, uh, in the uh, uh, the space multiplier, uh, almost all the numbers are one except for classrooms, which are thirty seven. Now, I, I guess I understand that you've got the what's per item column, and then you're multiplying that by the aggregate number of hours per year and uh, expressing it in kilowatt hours um, uh, for annual load. And so that's the way the table is set up, right? I think I understand that correctly. Um, but uh, so that means when we look at the classrooms and we've got 37 of those, and when we look into the classrooms and we have the iPads and Chromebooks within that 37, we've got 18 and 20. So I'm looking at those as being the, um, the places where we could be wrong because anything that's any estimate in the, uh, in the classroom usage uh, uh, per day per year if it's out, it's going to be multiplied by 37. And so I just I just note that the classrooms represent 38% of the annual load, but it's the place where we could be, it's the place where we could uh, lose our trousers most readily, I think. So I just want to, uh, it, 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 please push back if you think I'm wrong about this, but I just want to alert us now that that, uh, that set of rows seems to be the place where we should be concentrating uh, in the fullness of time on, on occupant behavior. And, and uh, I hope I understand it correctly. I think I do. The other place I was looking closely at were the, uh, were the usage that were 24 seven. And there's, um, there's six of those uh, rows of all of the rows there, the 24 seven throughout the year. So again, uh, making sure that we get the right pieces of equipment there, because if we're if we're if we're not correct there, then we are then the error is greater than it is in many of the other columns where the uh, the, the uh, projected use is much less. And I wanted to just uh, uh, ask John Sousa because the other place I'm looking at is the equipment items that are perhaps not used so very much, but have very large watts per item. So the assumptions on use for the uh, all of the cooking equipment uh, that start with the double convection oven and go down to the 40-gallon kettle, their um, five-digit, uh, uh, their double-digit kilowatt uh, um, uh, items. So uh, I assume, John, you've projected the use of... Uh, these items and that they're conservative because again if in this case if the hours of use are, are out then it's a bigger difference and and the plug loads in the kitchen of course depend on more than most on on the number of hours of use during the academic year yeah. so, uh, i'm going to pull up some of these the the slides you're talking about bruce that we it's a little easier. And I'm just going to jump in for a second to talk about the process. We actually had a couple discussions with uh, Mike O'Connell, the director of nutrition, and had him list out the pieces of equipment. And he gave us um, anticipated use with how he prepares food. So in a sense, it came directly from the source, but we still think it is okay. conservative. Uh, but John, happy to have you expand on that. If And what I put on the screen just for reference is, is the is the inventory spreadsheet that Bruce is is referencing with all of the plug loads. So you can uh... yeah, and 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 as as you, as you alluded to, Bruce, uh, so that something like the convection ovens would get certainly more use than say the range, which is like thirteen kW, right? Um, the range is probably the least used, right? So that's the good news. But when they need it, it's there, uh, and it's only probably if anything, a half hour a day, if that, whereas the convection ovens are probably four hours a day, right? For, as an example, I don't know what the exact yeah. numbers that that were given, but- um, yeah, Close to that, John. Yeah, yeah. so so not every, yeah, so so I, I'd, I'd say it's those bookends there, those convection ovens will be the most, those will be the workhorses and the, everything else is much less, much less intense. Okay. Yeah, and if I can add, Bruce, I mean, you're you're highlighting very, very important points, which are 
um, probably the second, you know, the second priority of a study like this is really understanding where your loads are going, right? And with with data that is much more related to your building than than you know than an, an average or default. And so yes, there's certain equipment that will be 24 hours, you know, walk and cool and walk and freezer. And so there's things that you can do about that, but you're going to need them 24 hours, right? A lot of the other kitchen equipment, it's there because it needs to be used. Um, it's always good to know what consumes most, right? Um, oftentimes people don't know that the dryer in their house is the single it's one of the single highest consuming mm -hmm. appliances at home and that sometimes we can avoid using those by, you know, drying, et cetera, you know, by line drying or something else. And so it's always good to know there's certain things that you cannot avoid as loads. Um, as for the computers and the classroom loads, those are always, you know, it's the best estimation possible. Um and we will never know unless we were metering every single classroom, right? We won't really know what the plug loads exactly are for every classroom. There will be a certain level of metering that we will, you know, that we'll be able to look at and compare. Um, we always want for this energy modeling process, right? And because we're, you know, that we can't predict the future, <laughs> no matter how much, you know, we try, the energy model is using a weather file that is not what's going to be the weather in 2027 or 2028 or 2029, the same way the occupancy and the usage of different equipment might be different as time evolves. Um, we want to be as close as possible to a conservative estimate, right? And so if we know that there will be 20 Chromebooks per classroom, we want to account for those and how those are going to get charged, right? Same with iPads, et cetera, et cetera. If you end up using less, that's great. Right. Our main goal is we want to make sure that we are aiming for that EUI of 25 and that you are and that you are able to, um, you know, to to measure that, you know, on average over the, you know, the, over mm. the, the occupied years. Um, so we're trying to do, you know, the best we can with the information we have to predict energy use and also to give you the certainty that or comfort, I would say certainty, probably not the right word, but uh, the comfort that your PV is being sized for, you know, a typical year, right? And so if you end up consuming less, that's great. You'll be generating energy. Um, if you end up consuming a little bit more or you're right at that, you know, at what's being estimated here, well, we will have accounted for that. Um, last thing to note is that when you reduce plug loads, so let's say, you know, the Chromebooks are only being, you know, charged for an hour and a half a day instead of three hours a day or whatever it is, right? Uh, yes, you will have a reduction in plug loads in the um, in in your energy use, but you will also have a little bit of an increase on your heating energy, right? And so, not using the plug loads doesn't directly translate to to just we can take that energy out of what we're predicting because the the plug loads um, do generate a little bit of heat and so there will be a balance there um, a little bit of a nuance on the on the energy modeling but you know again eliminating Chromebooks doesn't mean we're eliminating you know from the EUI the twenty three thousand you know twenty four thousand kilowatt hours there will be a compensation on the heating side but you're you're bringing up really really good points of identifying which are the you know, the drivers and, and knowing that and thinking about that as you operate your school moving forward. Bruce, you have more questions? Uh, just to just to say that, yes, I appreciate all that uh, you just said, uh, that, that, but the value of this for the classroom is that uh, whereas, for example, with the kitchen, we've got presumably one or two people who are uh, making decisions about usage and so forth. And, and uh, in the classroom, there's 37 or, 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 or a lot more. And so we can give these budgets. Uh, we, we can uh, check with the teachers. We can show them these are the budgets. We can use this document to uh, establish the basis on which they uh, can uh, verify that we're a lot more, more rather than less likely to succeed in our net zero so I, 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 I'm, I, we've been, Rudy and I particularly been looking for this for a long time and it's great to see it in, in this kind of detail and it surfaces all sorts of assumptions which we can check, review, but uh, it, it will be a benchmark for performance with uh, various people, various individuals, various uh, systems and so forth uh, that are not specifically building systems because of course that's why they're plug loads. The only... Um, the the, uh, the 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 walking cooler. I'd ask Rick 
uh, a week or so ago whether the uh, the load. So I think that's about twelve percent of the total load is attributable to walk-in freezers. And I thought, well, you know, theoretically, you could change that by increasing the uh, thickness of uh, all or some of the ceiling walls or floor components to this. And I think that uh, uh, um, Rupert noted that, uh, which is now the question, uh, as well as just, uh, I guess the, the question is, with the walk-in cooler and freezer, is this load simply a calculated heat loss for operating them at an 80 degree uh, delta T for every hour of the year? Or is are there on top of that uh, assumptions about how often the doors are opened and closed? Or does that matter? Uh, door is open and closed. I um so the the energy consumption for these um coolers and freezer typically accounts for door opening because that is where you lose uh, a lot of your energy. This electric just this energy, just to be clear, is the electricity that is needed to operate the walk-in cooler or the freezer, right? Then any heat gain or heat loss that results from um that results from um you know insulating the space or whatever it is then will be taken into account by the energy model itself but not necessarily this if that makes sense but this this should account for um the manufacturers typically will account for how much energy is needed uh for regular use of walking in and walking out okay oops sorry uh, Bruce, so you you in asking that question, you actually brought up a good a good point for us. So we went and looked at that, and and the prime, the, just I'm just giving you some of the background. The prime the prime spec that we we use, they they not all foams are built the same. So the foam that we're using, we're able to get, we're able to we're able to exceed the Department of Energy um, R values with a four inch panel. So what your question did was was it forced it, it it pointed out to me that we don't actually list those r values in our spec so we went ahead and we put those r values in our spec and what the manufacturer had said is we can do it in four inches we can exceed those requirements so we don't need to go to five inches and if we did go to five inches we really wouldn't be able to downsize the compressors so what we did was we put those r values in our specification so that as an open bid situation we want we want the most efficient. So we're going to force those other vendors if they need to, to exceed those R values to, to go to a five inch panel. So it remains to be seen whether we'll need, we may get a five inch panel depending on who the manufacturer is. So I think we're covered either way. And then the run times on those compressors, I think we have 24 hours. It's actually, it, it could be somewhere between 16 and 20. Um, depending on the season. So in the winter, probably less. In the summer, 20 hours a day that those compressors will be running. I just want to point that out if you wanted to know Okay, that. so that's actually a conservative estimate. And thank you, John. Yeah, very... I asked that question partly so you could uh, answer that question for other people in the public audience who I think will be as interested as I was. So thank you. Okay, I think... Um, yeah, I'm just... can come back to you, Bruce. I just want to make sure everybody gets... A chance yeah. to ask a first round of questions. Uh, so, so, um, John, I think you just answered the question I was going to ask um, with the specs on what it is we're buying in the kitchen. There are some areas where we can look for more energy efficient um, and put <clears throat> that to what we're looking to buy, you know. And I don't know enough about commercial ch kitchens on how much, you know. Uh, school size kitchen on whether it's the convection oven, the coolers, mm -hmm. the freezers, you know, in our homes, many of us are being told if you're going off, well, we have propane, um, go to an induction stove if you're going all electric because it will be more energy efficient. So mm -hmm. it's just a question on the range that's available for school to purchase. Are we, we're gonna be specifying the high, the most energy conserving uh, sets of equipment, as I think what I just heard you say, is that correct? Yes, well, it, yeah, well, yes and no, but I'll, I'll explain. So for example, we, what I just said about the R values in the walk -ins, so we, we actually put in going forward, that's what we'll do, right? So we want the most efficient foam we can get. 
on hot holding cabinets, we go with fully insulated cabinets that are Energy Star rated so that we can input the least amount of, of, of wattage into those cabinets to keep the food warm. Uh, with respect to the hot wells, we specify a low watt well because we don't need a high watt well if you know if we if we can get away with a low watt well. So we, we're always looking for those efficiencies. So we've done that. On the reach-in refrigerated units, the, the point of use refrigeration, we've gone with Energy Star units um, because they have better insulation. The gasketing is better. The compressors are uh, much more efficient. The motors are electrically commuted, so they're they're kind of ramping up and, and 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 slowing down based on what the actual demand is. So they're smarter units. Now, on the case of the range, that one's a little tricky. So really, the only piece of equipment that can use induction would be the range top. It's the least used piece of equipment. It, there may be weeks that it doesn't even get used. Um, if I had gone to an induction there, and I could, I'd have to make the hood larger. And the energy consumption in doing that would be so much more than going with the smallest possible electric resistance range I could go with. So that's what I chose to do. Um, but again, I can I can make those adjustments. I went with a four burner range. I could squeeze in a two burner induction range, but I think you, we might be hamstringing ourselves. And then the next size up for an induction range would be a three foot wide unit, which would be which would mean adding another foot to the side of the hood, which increases the fan, which increases the amount of CFM that we have to pull out, which increases the amount of CFM we have to put back in. So I chose to go with the most efficient in terms of size uh, in that one case, because it, it is such a, a little used piece of equipment, but we're happy to evaluate. And, and if others have concerns or, or experience with that, we're happy to make adjustments if needed. No, and as I said, I know nothing about this. So I was just more looking at the plug load for the kitchen and trying to think of where there were opportunities. So I, I, I see, I see Rupert, you answered my question. So Rupert, okay. I'm not looking to increase costs and I'm certainly not looking to increase energy use with a hood. So Rupert. Rupert. Uh, John, I think this question is probably for you. Um, with our walk-in coolers that we have scattered around the building, various buildings we have, there are different energy saving schemes. Some of the older coolers, if they open that door, um, the condenser, uh, the evaporator fans don't shut off. Uh, if they're loading in for half an hour, we get all kinds of alarms because the air temperature goes up. Mm -hmm. um, other ones have door switches that disable the evaporator fans for a period of time. Uh, other ones have um, uh, energy schemes where once the temperature is satisfied, it slows down the fans or turns off several of the fans. What my question for you is: What kind of uh, energy stuff are you uh, specking out for the walk-ins? So we do a couple things. So we we have the we have the, the smart controller on the coils, so the coil will sense demand and slow down and speed up depending on what what it needs. We also do um, instead of a time defrost, which means what happens is those coils, for example, if if I want that room to be at 34 degrees, that means that coil temperature needs to be at um, 24 degrees. So you get frost buildup on that. And at a certain point, that frost gets to the point where the unit stops working. So you have to turn on a heater to defrost that. And the old style walk-ins, that heater would come on whether you needed it or not. So what we've done is we're specifying a system that will sense whether it needs it or not and only turn on that heat when it needs it. So you may go weeks without having to defrost the coil, which is a, a tremendous savings. So, so we've built that in. Uh, we have um, the capability to tie in the cooler to the BMS system so you can see what your run times are, so that you can see what your temperature ranges are. Um, we have a controller on the door that will sense how many times you open the door. Uh, how long the door was open so that you can track that. Uh, we've put self-closing hinges on the doors. We've also added strip curtains to the door so that when they are loading, uh, we're preserving as much of that that cool, that refrigerated air as possible. So we've we've done we've done everything we could um, to be as efficient as possible, but also still making it practical to use because what like, for example, you might see schemes out there where the walk-in freezer door goes through the cooler. Well, 
that's one way to do it, but it's also impractical in terms of, you know, its function. So we, we, we wanted to make it as functional as possible, but also as, 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 um, as efficient as possible so that when that door is open, it's open for the least amount of time as possible. Uh, so that's, that's, those are some of the things that we've done with the, with the walk-ins. Well, that's great. Thank you so much, John. I appreciate all of those ideas, and I think they're all great ones. LED so, lights, too. So, <laughs> so oh, yeah. super yeah, efficient. Yeah, yeah. And ECM, ECM evaporator fans, I'm yes. sure. Yep, yes, yep. Fantastic. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Jacob? Uh, thanks. Um, fantastic work. This is really great to see this degree of um, granularity and, and consideration around these loads. So yeah, just super, super um, terrific um, to read this memo. Um, so it sounds like uh, the variables around equipment runtime are, are already buffered based on you know, presuming 24 hour runtime on the, the cooler and the freezer, for example. So there's some buffer put in there and that's that's great. I think most of my, I have sort of a two part question that's um, around knowing that we're kind of bumping our heads at the 25 UI cap here. And so just looking at um, on the human variable side of things, um, I didn't know if um, it is just your level of confidence around um, miscellanea and, and sort of buffer for, for example, like some classroom tabletop experiments that use some plug-in resistance heat or just some, some of those other ones that are gonna be impossible to predict, but knowing that things may show up without having to have, um, you know, to find point of a energy management, you know, plan for, for individual teachers. What's the headroom like on the human side of things? I think I'm looking mostly at the classroom. Um, there may be other rooms that would have some of that as well. That's the, the first part. And I can add a, a very uh, uh, practical example of this. Um, the current Fort River teachers for many, many, many years, that I think it was the first or second grade would often hatch chicks. And so there's a plug-in exactly. incubator for that. It's obviously, a, you know, what, a couple of weeks a year, but... <laughs> From well, an energy I, standpoint, oh, go ahead, Irma. No, no, go ahead, Ali. Okay. Um, I was going to say, I think there's two, you know, there might be two questions in one. Um, from an energy standpoint, I would argue that a couple of weeks a year is as much of an error. I mean, I think everyone understands and agrees that we're doing the best to, you know, to guess what a typical year for typical usage, you know, would look like from an energy consumption standpoint. And a couple of weeks a year of equipment intensive, you know, usage in a classroom, I think will amount to as large, you know, or as small an error bar as you could guess. It's like, is this going to be a really hot year or are we going to have, you know, a cold spell, you know? And so I would say it falls absolutely it will change how much energy you use, but what we're doing here is we're not predicting how much energy we will use exactly. We're trying to make our best guess so that we can use the model to make informed decisions about design. And so I would say totally falls within the error bars of, you know, of, of what we're guessing here. Uh, if this were, um, you know, if they were hatching the entire, like hatching the chicks the entire year, uh, this is something that should have been, you know, listed in, you know, in the equipment list, and maybe it was a lot, maybe it wasn't that much, right? And so that that's what makes the difference. There's definitely variability. They're probably not going to be using, you know, three hours exactly of the Chromebook, you know, times twenty, times thirty-seven. If you think about that, that's huge, you know, as as Bruce pointed out. So falls within the margin of ever of error, I would say. Yeah, awesome. I just I I think to all I mentioned earlier that we were there's sort of uh, these are all leaning on the conservative side so where there is extra usage or additional equipment in some areas that is balanced by also efficiencies because we've been ultra conservative in the assumptions the schedule and the um the usage assumptions in other areas so so it's it's sort of as close as you can get to to um, a prediction in advance of the building being in operation. Love it. Perfect. Thank you. Um, yeah, sometimes I see the 
buffer sort of lined out as a separate item and sometimes it's just padded within the existing numbers and so yeah just great to know what your what the logic is there i appreciate that um so to that end again i think like heroic job in being as predictive as possible um to that end and apologies if i'm bringing up something i've been harping on um since the last meeting but um this is i think more of a question i think for the um for school staff and school representatives um to the extent that you hold value in being able to monitor some of the the, the actual consumption, for example, of you know uh, the cafeterias being used differently, the, the kitchens being used differently, or classrooms. Obviously, classrooms are not being individually monitored, but you know a, a bank, a wing of classrooms is being monitored. What's the expectation around doing that monitoring, and do we feel confident that um, uh, facility staff will be able to get that information out of the DMS, and that you feel solid about that? I know I brought that up earlier. It seemed like that was uh, at least received. I don't know. I just want to make sure that everyone feels good about the current, um, yeah, uh, actual um, living with the building and monitoring um, part of things, because I've I've seen that fall down in the past and you have a really great opportunity at this point to make sure that the facilities that feel good about keeping an eye on whatever they're able to keep an eye on. So I think Rupert is our school staff on this. Yes, on this call. And, you know, so Rupert, you can, you can offer thoughts on what may be possible. And I know one of the issues at the larger committee, we've talked about, um, trying to start as soon as possible. We're thinking of like guidelines, ways to engage teachers, you know, to have this be something that people understand. So Rupert, I, I don't know. I mean, we're, we're in the world of our school system. We're still wrestling with budgets right now for this year. Um, so, but thinking forward on when this school opens, what, what we can put in place. Rupert. Yeah. Um, well, whoops. Wait a minute. Okay. Um, just hold my microphone up so you guys can hear me. I um, I think that it is going to be an ongoing challenge uh, to change how folks think about and use energy in their classrooms and in their school. I don't think we could just wave, wave a magic wand and have it happen um you know i understand the theory it's like you got to give information and feedback so that people can then see the results of changing behavior um and so all of the metering and all of the displays and for example you know how many times and for how long is the walk-in cooler door open that kind of data can be used to help uh train people to more energy efficient usage um I think that we have an uphill battle in terms of um, the perception uh, that uh, open windows is better air than filtered mechanical ventilation, um, even though it can be very costly energy-wise and not actually increase the quality of the air. That's a perception that I just, I, I don't see that changing in my lifetime. Folks are used to the residential model where ventilation happens when you turn up the thermostat uh, and it's no fresh air at all. It's just recirculation. And I don't know how to change that, that image. Um, uh, I don't know how to get folks to understand that, um, but certainly we have to try. Uh, so I don't think I'm saying anything very bright and rosy. I'm sorry for that, but um, I'll stop talking for the moment. Okay, and I may have uh, inaccurately phrased the question. I, I have no expectations that uh, human behavioral management is within the scope of work. Mostly, just making sure you can get the data, so that if something, well, I don't want to avoid uh, on the as you know from my owner's rep hat on. I want to avoid if the bills are significantly higher, the power consumption. Let me be more explicit. The the power consumption is explicitly larger than um, we were predicting um, that could never have been anticipated on behalf of the design team. I just want to make sure there's a mechanism for being able to narrow down on where those loads are coming from. And is it an equipment malfunction? Is it someone is brooding chicks year round? Is it, you know, someone sneaking in the toaster oven and so on and so forth? Um, <laughs> I just want to make sure that, you know, as whoever is responsible for following up on that has the 
tools in place uh, between the submetering and the information coming out of the BMS, the ability to interface to the BMS. I think the place I've seen this fall down in the past where it requires a very expensive BMS specialist to get useful information out of the system so that it can actually be actionable on a more regular basis. Um, and if, if that's the, so yeah, I just, I want to, I'm just trying to make sure that you have the ability to monitor it, the behavioral gotcha. modification pieces. Yeah. Sure. We leave that's well beyond the scope of our conversation, at least in the design side. Uh, I feel like the design team has done a heroic job of being as predictive as humanly possible, but knowing that it is impossible to predict, it's once the building starts getting used, can you track where the energy is going if it's not meeting the, uh, the model? Yeah, I mean, my uh, sorry about going down that rabbit hole. Uh, oops. <laughs> uh, um, uh, in terms of, in terms of uh, energy, uh, um, I, I, I we've been working with the VAV International. I think that they are... Um, really good at getting the information that's actionable both in terms of maintenance as well as as you know where are things going wrong on the hvac stuff mm -hmm. um in terms of the plug load stuff um i don't i know there's a lot of submetering going on i know that there's a limit to the uh, how granular we can get that data but i think that there's going to be a lot of electric submetering that the bms will pick up um in terms of accessing the information um uh you know that's always a challenge the the uh, uh bms controls um how much training can you put in and uh what's your capacity of of, of your maintenance staff to, to look at that um so we will probably need to uh spend some more time on training uh for a number of people to, to get to that uh that level but um i think we can do it great thank you appreciate it Kevin, can you just give an overview of, just for the sake of what the granularity with the current design that the sub during occurs? Sure, absolutely. First of all, right now, the design includes 18 sub-meters. Um, we've got a meter on the main for the switchboard that's the entire building so that we capture that in the BMS modeling. Um, we have it broken down into the in interior lighting, the elevator, the geothermal system, just the pump system itself, the um, the skid and the pumps to get the uh, water out of the ground. We have HVAC ventilation. We have HVAC pump loads. Uh, we've got the kitchen, but unfortunately the kitchen is broken up into three different meters based on there's a 208 volt panel, there's a 40 volt panel, and then there's an emergency panel for refrigeration. Um, the technology, we've, we're metering the technology. And what that is, is that's, that's, that's the MDF and all the IDF rooms are all on emergency power. And that is metered separately. We have receptacle loads. Um, right now we have it broken up where we have a receptacle, which is we just monitor all the receptacles in the building. And then we break the meat that we break the um, receptacles down per floor of the classroom building for a second and third floor. Um, we have outside lighting also is is it, and it adds up to 18 meters. As I would say for troubleshooting, um, you know if you if things go out of whack, I think your first is on a monthly basis your bill from Eversource. You know you see what you start seeing your trending of what the building uses, and you, if you see a month that goes out of whack there a little bit, and then from there you can go into um, you know looking at the lighting. You know, you obviously you, you look for to see if you've got lighting on at night or you know, something, the program got lighting program got changed or HVAC, the same thing to make sure you're not seeing loads at night through your trending, um, you know, just seeing that, you know, picking up the data from uh, looking at your hours of operation outside of your normal usage to make sure everything is shutting down properly. And then, then to go to the granular level of what the usage is, you know, per floor, if you see one of the floors is receptacles has gone a little higher than normal, and then it's time for Rupert to take a walk through the floor. And, and like I said, if you're finding you've got, you know, chicks living in room 301 and turtles living in 303 and, you know, then you see where you're, um, you know, where you've gone out of the model a little bit on your usage. I'm going to play a little bit of timekeeper. It's about 1050. 
Um, and I just want to see if there's any last questions before we uh, move on to the next agenda item. So any more questions on the energy uh, politics, I mean, the plug load piece of our, our conversation. Great. So we can move on. And as I, my memory recalls, it's the energy models, the next thing up. Is that correct? Uh, yep. Great. All right, so we're going to give a brief uh, a brief overview <clears throat> of the model update. Um, you know, as always, as we move to the next phase, there's always updates to models. Uh, the building geometry was update. Uh, envelope thermal properties um, have been very carefully studied by the design team and Thornton Thomas City. Um, and so that was updated as well. Uh, the internal loads were optimized. Uh, we know the Again, this is this is a clear example of, you know, we tend to assume 0.55 for schools uh, as a default lighting power density to start off with, but the actual design is a 0.47, so we actually updated that. That's great, we're saving energy there. Uh, the plug loads were updated based on the plug load study, and then several aspects of the HVAC systems were updated um, as the process, as we moved into the process of 90% CDs. Uh, big picture. Uh, the EUI is uh, roughly um, the same, as you can tell. Uh, some things moved as up, some things moved as down. And so you'll see that even though it's the same, there's, you know, the colors are changing a little bit. The lighting got smaller and certain things got larger. But big picture, we're still below 25 and we're still keeping our 15 lead points. And um, in terms of net zero energy, this is still falls within... Uh, within the expectation of uh, for, um, for 24.8 24 EUI, uh, the PV generation, the expected PV generation would be cover, covering 100% of that with a little bit more, again, with allowing for variability for different years and, and, and different usages, et cetera, et cetera. And so as we, you know, as an update to our project goals, we're still, uh, achieving net zero energy, we're still meeting the EUI of 25 target, and we are still maximizing the number of lead points. I don't know if there are any comments or questions on there. Okay. Um, my comment is this is terrific and, and, and good news, and thank you for the work. And it's more um, your relationship with Eversource, where at one point I understood you were also their energy and modeling consultant. So once you come up with these numbers and the building is being built, they had these two big incentives. One was the huge one, over a million dollars, um, that they they believed we were gonna be at 25 or less. Does what you've done ensure in some way that they will come to the same conclusion? I That may be a leading question the way I've asked it, but it's like, is your modeling result gonna be enough for them to say, you know, yes. And I understand the next piece, which is the smaller piece, is look at our actual use a year later, and then there's a smaller piece we would get. So that's my yes, yeah. As you're alluding, Kathy, there's the two parts to the energy to the incentives that Mass Saves provides. There's the post construction incentive, and then there's the um, there's the post occupancy operation one year of um, operations. They look at to to look at the that second incentive. Um, as the, as the, um, technical advisor for, for Eversource, um, on the post, uh, post construction incentive side, we have been reviewing all the drawings, um, to ensure that what is being reflected in the energy model is what is also what's reflected in the design drawings, um, in the project sets. And so that it is built as, as it's being modeled, um, and it's and vice versa that it's modeled as it's um as we're looking for it to be built. So uh that process is meant to ensure that yes, it is going to meet the um the requirements to to get to the 25 UI target. Thank you. Of course, it's, it's up to you know, Eversource is reviewing that, but every memo that we issue to Eversource um with our review, they look at. 
um, to see that it actually meets um, sort of requirements um, from their end as well. Thank you. So my sure. follow up on that, yeah, it's just, um, I'm also just double checking what's in the drawings and specs to see right, what can I decipher the R values are, the window performances, all those sorts of things. I've tallied that and sent a report um, back to the design team. And there, there are some questions that I still have just from what I've been able to decipher from the specs and the drawings, which the, the details all look great. I don't want to imply otherwise. Um, it's just the notes and, and the specs to really dial down to make sure that it's crystal clear what the requirements are on the envelope because it's open bid particularly. So I know that uh, we haven't seen your energy model report yet, but I assume the inputs will be listed out there. And then I could cross-reference that to what I've come up with. And also you can too, because you have that report. So I, it's just to say that I'm glad you all are doing that. We're doing it too, just to make sure we've looked at it multiple times to make sure that everything is perfectly in alignment again, because it's open bid. Sure, yeah, thank you. And and we really appreciate the review that, that you've been doing, uh, Shelly. And, and the, um, the, as you're alluding to the envelope requirements, there's also the code aspect to this. Um, th so we've been, in order to meet code, we have to, uh, you know, there's the envelope backstop analysis, um, the component alternative, um, alternative component analysis, uh, which has been informing uh, the the U values of the walls and and some of the uh, and you know derating it for linear thermal bridges and whatnot, and so all of that is um, all of that will be clearly laid out. Those those assumptions and inputs will be laid out in the energy model report, and then there will also be the um, the backstop envelope memo, which will summarize all of the how we derived all of the um, the derated value U values um, that we were using for the for envelope. Perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions on the energy model? Okay. Well, Margaret, could you bring the Agenda back up. I have forgotten what the what the next agenda item was. And Sorry, the next thing was super brief update. Um, I just I wanted um, Rick and Tim to just to describe how the geothermal and the photovoltaic um, equipment and connections are being procured because there is there are different versions of how to do this and you know which pieces to tie to which pieces and i thought we should the committee should understand the direction they had chosen so rick and tim if you could do that sure. that would be great sure uh as far as the uh geothermal uh procurement uh the geothermal design is being done through VAV, our HVAC designer with Wellspring, their consultant. But we, after much discussion, decided that the best uh, way to get it procured and, and uh, get it incorporated into the work is to have that geothermal well production uh, and everything basically outside of a flange of a of a pipe coming up into the building being the responsibility of the general contractor and not having to uh, expect an HVAC contractor to sub subcontract that work himself and schedule it with the general contractor when it takes such a big area of the site uh while it's being done <laughs> so giving it to the general contractor gives him the flexibility to schedule the well drilling when he needs it basically makes him responsible for it and uh takes a little heat off the hvac subcontractors they're just picking up on uh the chilled water from a flange and in, inside the building and using it uh the pv uh the pv is all being 
made the responsibility of the electrical subcontractor. Uh, and that includes the exterior canopies, uh, the uh, some uh, bidding laws require anything that's not routinely done by a subcontract himself be what is called a paragraph E sub sub bid. So the PV uh, canopy system and its wiring would be one uh, paragraph E sub sub bid. And the exterior, uh, the parking lot structure, the galvanized steel, uh, structural steel and the foundations would be a second paragraph E. That way the electrical contractor is responsible for the entire package and is responsible. The electrical subcontractor is probably a 50-50 uh, chance at installing the PV panels themselves. One of our uh, likely to be uh, pre-qualified electrical subcontractor is currently under contract on another one of our projects as a general contractor to install owner's owner owned PV on a public building. So the Schmitz and the Griffins and of the world have that capability, but if they want to farm it out, they can put somebody else in that in their bid. Uh, that's basically the overview. If there are any other questions about that. Let me know. Kathy? Um, it's not really a question, Rick, um, but it just so others know, um, the there is, a, we at least tentatively have said there's going to be additional money to put more panels on the parking lot, on the section that panels and canopies. And Danisco made absolutely the right decision to go ahead with the design for the building and thinking about um, later, I'm, my question is you would be contracting with the same contractor who's put in the solar canopies and panels on the parking lot for an additional set. That That's the way, you, that's how you had proposed doing it. It would be in essence a change order. Right. When, when we have and would we and when with the packaging that the town um there's some potential other draws on that money right now so i'm glad it's not in your design but but um, it's the timing when you would need to know exactly the amount of money um so that the town could potent get uh how many panels and kilowatt hours does that buy knowing that it's you got to do the canopies. You've got to do the wiring. So it's not just multiple at times the cost of a canopy. So is that, you know, is that in early twenty twenty seven, late twenty twenty six? Some what, kind of when when would that need to be known in terms of dollars and then translating it into yield? Uh, and I don't need an exact. You no, know, I'm it, just I'm just saying so. The, the the design that's being built you know has provisions very basic provisions but recognizes that there could be canopies over the north parking lot uh you're asking when you would need, need to know how many you might do and i guess the discussion would be if you had say a half million dollars worth and the north parking lot could take two then you're saying give me a half million dollars worth and you may not want to stop there in the future because someday you may want to install the rest so there's still some design i think from a from a uh, some notion would need to need to be known uh let's see 24 i'd say in 25 because we're asking the contractor to do some pretty heavy lifting to have a lot of that north parking lot available for staff to park in beginning 26. So they'd have to know when they're going to install that stuff sometime. 
and it'll probably be let's see so they'll probably I'm shooting from the hip if it's going to be done it would be the summer of 27. Okay no that, that's helpful you know if it's if we're using ARPA money we have to designate it by the end of this year 24 so so there would be shooting for 25 on this is the dollars we're talking about should be doable so thank you Other questions, comments? Did I hear something out of Bruce? Oh. <laughs> Great. Um, Margaret, I'm going to again lean on you to help. Yeah. So, um, honestly, uh, we're this is the last item on the agenda we are now at is um, sub metering as it relates to lobby display. So, um, Kathy, maybe you want to talk about this a little bit in terms of the notion of the lobby display and then um, where that came from. And um, Shelley and Jacob and I can talk about, um, you know, what the the implications for sub metering. So, Kathy? Yeah, so um, when I, way back when, meaning last year when I was talking about the school and trying to encourage everyone to vote yes on raising their taxes to pay for the school. Um, people thought of this as it's going to be a model and young kids are at an age they can learn about energy, they can learn about the environment. So we should be trying to think of how to feed back some of the information and learning capacity to the kids so that we wouldn't be just setting it up so everyone could walk around and say, aren't we great? So it was, could we set up simple a simple display? Um, and it could be in the entryway to the school that is showing you um, how much energy you use, how much was generated in kilowatt hours, something simple. And then I asked, um, and then people got really excited about the idea that this, and that the teachers could have this information, you could use it as a teaching tool. Um, so the, I asked whether any of these exist in grade schools, in elementary schools, or anywhere that are simple. And Shelley and Jacob went out and they found a few, one of which was very interesting in a, a, a elementary school in in DC. I had also seen that this was in another school in uh, this discovery school in Northern Virginia. And then there are a few other places. So since then, since we we didn't know one of the things of what what the capacity of the way we're capturing the energy use, could you be showing, you know, that the fifth floor used this much energy versus the fourth floor? Could you mainly show, you know, the gym, the cafeteria, you know, to what extent could you capture that? And then this is what, what's being flashed up here is this piece. I also approached Amherst College to ask them whether I gave them this and several others that you found, Shelley and Jacob, and said, could you all design something like this for us? Um, and there is a terrific science teacher that, that Denisco has met who, because she was also on playground and involved some people who will be the users of it in designing it. And they expressed some interest, but then they pulled back a little bit. So it was like trying to, it wouldn't be buying off the shelf. Although this, this thing that's being showed for the John Lewis, it's being produced by a company that could probably quickly design something if we didn't want it to look just like this. So it was, my my question was would we would be already be wired for this since it it uses internet information um it's constant feed and it can only in real time show what we're capturing in terms of energy use and solar and and I'll just stop there so that's what the general the, that's where the general idea came from for my own house I can see what my solar panels are generating every day and it that, that's simple. It's provided by the solar thing. And it tells me how many trees I've 
saved over a number of years. <laughs> you know, it tells, but that's it's all it shows me, and it shows me that some months are better than others, and how do I compare? Um, so I'll, I'll stop right there, Margaret, because we we put it up, but we're still at that beginning phase, and the question was kind of what are what Danisco has already built in, so what kinds of, um, and this would be a teaching tool, Rupert, this would be one where you could say, hey, guys, you know, halfway through the year, we're doing really well, or we're not doing so well. And it's because, and name, you know, something that's human behavior controllable, you know, it's a feedback system. So the, the very last thing I'll just say is that thing that was just shown for the, for the DC school, I can see what the school is doing. You know, it's just a simple interface. So anybody could load it up on their laptop. I mean, it could be looked at and it's it's it wouldn't be hardwired just for this one little monitor. And I'll stop there. Yeah, I you know, I, I can never figure out if there's a chat function in, in um Zoom, but I would um if there were, <laughs> I would put this um the, the, town has, the town has turned it off, so you can't. When we've said, oh, uh, that so that makes sense. So yeah, you, you can find it by googling John Lewis Elementary Sphere CMTA. Yeah, I, I can I can send it out to everyone on this call who hasn't already seen it. Um, and I think we thought that was the most interesting because it had lots of features. But the Kern Center here, yeah. Amherst, has an interesting one. It's just designed for a different purpose. I mean, it's not a school and it's not, you know, eight year olds. <laughs> yeah. So so I think the 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 issue here that we're just about to kind of finalize flushing out, hopefully with some um, advice from Shelley and Jacob is there's a certain amount of sub metering that's designed into the building. We're about, you know, we're getting very close to getting to bed. Um, just looking, Shelley and Jacob are hopefully going to give us some feedback on whether we should add any to facilitate this. And then Kathy's going to continue the discussion with Amherst College and others about what this might look like. And then there's a plan uh, for a location in the lobby to mount a display that would be, you know, sort of a big digital display. Um, so that's the, up the update I wanted to give. Shelley and Jacob, do you want to add anything to that? I would just add, like, to me, what is important in an educational setting is that it is interactive. Like, if you're just feeding information, it's going to be interesting for about half a second, and then people will tune it out. What's important is that the information is something that teachers can then take and have students running experiments or math problems or, you know, science problems, whatever the case may be. That's what's really critical about whatever this interactive system is. So for example, you'll want to pair the metered information of the building performance with weather data. So a weather station is important with a sundial, for example, a sundial, just having a, you know, a very simple sundial can be super helpful. And you can then take your iPads out with the building data right in front of you as you're looking at the sundial. And you can tell right then and there, where's the sun, what's going on figure out the angle it's hitting the panels, you know, cloud cover, et cetera. This, it's that interactive nature that's really critical. With the sub metering, um, you know, I think you can, you can, at least it's by floor. I think that's pretty good. Like I, it particularly if, if that also um, is by grade, like, you know, it, in terms of like motivating people, one of the things that works is setting up competitions between it could be between floors. It could be between grade levels. I don't think we're going to get down to a classroom level. All that that would be amazing that a classroom could know what they're using in their classroom because that feed loop would be feedback loop would be really super strong, and it's expensive to do that. So I think you just have to find that right balance um, with the with the teaching staff, with the faculty involved in the conversation of you know how are we going to set up this for academic purposes and make it actionable into our teaching plans and and then also any sort of motivational competitions that we might have. I think those are the key points. 
Yeah, I don't think I have anything really substantial. I was a great, great angle, and I am uh, I am no expert in uh, childhood education as it relates to this stuff. So, in terms of leading with what's necessary, I'm definitely not the right person to weigh in on that. I will say I know uh, more information isn't necessarily better. Um, and I am keenly yeah. aware of the expense and complexity of adding more and more data points. And so um, I would be I would be very keen to see uh, what what we can do with the information that's already being collected from the DMS and try and set up as effectively as possible rather than getting into customizing the DMS for the sake of the of the um, of an interactive tool. As awesome as that would be, I just think that the pragmatics of this, especially at ninety percent, CD is probably um, would, would the value I don't think would be there, knowing how much submetering is already happening and how many learning opportunities I'm expecting could be could be developed. I guess the other thing I'll just note um, when I've seen this go into other schools, uh, I'm thinking of the Putney School in particular at their field house and another one too that's not coming to mind. They had more of a like a proprietary display that was directly connected and. At some point, some wire fixed out or something went wrong, the display went down. I think there's a lot to be said about having something that is cloud-based that takes some of the hardware dependencies off of the system. So um, knowing that we haven't landed on a platform yet, um, I would definitely continue to support anything cloud-based that makes the monitors swappable without that all being literally hardwired into the data collection process is gonna be a little more resilient for the long-term. So moon. Yes, I just wanted to state that we have 18 submeters. So the displays could be as simple as bar chart showing each category, how much energy is used, and perhaps even show what a typical other building will be like. Uh, that will be actual usage for us to estimate, uh, let's say per floor or per grade, that'll be a little more difficult. We'll, we could only calculate and make an estimate, but it will not be actual. KWs. So we need feedback from you, what level you want us to design. We don't want to overwhelm them, so. Yeah, I think on, on the per floor, really the information is really on the plug loads, which I think you are sub metering per floor. I mean, those are the actionable things that, that you know, the, that you can affect in the classroom. Whereas, you know, the HVAC unit, you know, I don't, that's not really an actionable item on a okay. classroom basis. Rupert. Yeah, I was thinking about the HVAC. <clears throat> I mean, it. Um, uh, one thing that we could do probably, I, I don't know what the capabilities are of the, um, of, of the BAS uh, programming uh, that we have here in other, in my previous job, I worked with a different BAS, and I could do any kind of, um, you know, summing, calculating, trend making, uh, quite easily. Um, but we could, for example, just take a look at how much heating or cooling is happening uh, on a floor by floor basis, and compare it to outside air temperature, or something like that, just by extracting the data and getting it up onto the display. Um, uh, you know, we could calculate that based on valve position or uh, or something similar. Um, but anyway, uh, just an idea. Ksenia? My understanding, and maybe the design team can confirm this, is what we do have on a classroom-by-classroom -classroom basis is temperature sensors and humidity sensors, right? We've got thermostats and humidity sensors. So it seems like with some um, savvy data mining of the existing um, information, we would at least be able to know where windows are opened, especially on a regular basis. Um, and based on that, which classrooms are requiring more heating and cooling, I don't know how to, um, you know, um, uh, carefully and politely introduce that into any sort of a, you know, building wide display, because I also, I think we would have to be careful about how punitive some of this information comes across. Educational is probably better than punitive, but to, to a certain extent, we, we were not going to have energy metering on a classroom basis. And it sounds like, but we, in terms of plug load, but instead of, in terms of heating and cooling, we might. 
Yes, uh, each classroom has a humidity sensor. So we know it's that to protect from a chill water, uh, chill beam from condensing. So we know when the windows are open, so we can point that out. And when that happens, it reduces cooling capacity. So uh, whoever opened the window will notice that it's now no longer comfortable. And when it comes to number of points and program capability of BMS system, we could give you thousands and thousands of point of information, challenges to how to condense it so that it's understandable and usable. Mm -hmm. So I think, Jonathan, that was the main reason this was on the agenda is it's not a... Yeah. Can I ask a really quick question? Go ahead. Um, is there... Um, have we heard anything from technologists or science staff or anyone with any more specific input or thoughts or feedback prior to everything getting finalized? All knowing that they're the ones that are actually going to be responsible for deploying curriculum and working with the students. I mean, I, in, a, in an ideal scenario, they would, you know, have some concept of what they're looking for. We can make sure we design to their needs. I know that's, we're not going to be starting some exhaustive process at this point. I just didn't know if, if anything, if we've gotten any feedback from any of them at this point, just to make sure that, um, you know, we've got as much of the, the, the curricular perspective involved here as possible. Kathy, I don't know, has uh, Tammy talked to uh, any of her, her folks in house or, um, Part of me wonders if we shouldn't send out a little bit more of a broader um, search for for folks who might be interested in this. Um, there might actually be, you know, folks at the middle school or the high school, um, you know, where the. I, what I'm imagining is that this is web based. Yes, the kids in the school will get something out of it, but I can imagine that um, an enterprising middle school or high school science teacher might also want to do something with it as well. Robert? Well, I was just going to say at the middle and high school level, we have uh, some very active uh, environmental action clubs yeah. um, that uh, love to try to figure out what they can do to make a difference. Yeah. Uh, and uh, to understand better some of the options and technology that's out there. So I think certainly at the secondary <clears throat> level, there's there could be a lot of interest. Uh, I don't know of uh, curricular discussions and i think it may be one of those um chicken and egg things it's like whatever we can provide i think the teachers will try to utilize uh if it's available to them um you know and so do we do we ask them what they want uh, do they know what's possible it's an interesting conversation to consider okay yeah, I think to that then in hearing kind of where we're still at in the exploration process on the curricular side of things, I'd suggest that we hold with the constraints of what's currently being submetered and the um, data streams that are already kind of built into the design. Again, it's it's quite robust and I would be loath to add any additional budget or complexity into that system and say, let's work within those constraints for the educational opportunities. And then it seems like if we're sort of presuming it, a monitor display and that everything else would be cloud-based. It seems like that gives the maximum amount of flexibility for how curricular opportunities could be developed from that from that platform. Um, I don't, obviously I'm not in the position to make any decisions here, but as uh, that would be my recommendation, particularly for being able to get through the rest of the, get out to bid without having uh, potentially, um, you know, this is the sort of thing that if we ask for an extra data point and that impacts like multiple trades and gets like it gets thorny quickly when you actually have to run wires to places and getting all that stuff integrated is non-trivial. So um, I can see in, in our collective best interest to just sort of roll with what we got and work within those boundaries. But I want to like ask the question formally and make sure we, there wasn't a really important opportunity or expectation that was getting mixed uh, missed in just making that call. Rupert? You know, um, I think that the, the display in the kiosk that we're talking about in the sort of public half part of the first floor, the more public part, is uh, probably less useful as a teaching tool than giving access to teachers in their classrooms. Um, and it may be that what we need in the classrooms 
is more granular than what we would put out for our um, aren't we doing great um, you guys paid for this and you're wonderful thank you so much kind of messaging Kathy um, yeah I th think this is th n number one I think we just had the conversation that we were hoping to have and yes we it doesn't affect uh, this all the bid papers going forward there has yet been a focused discussion about this at either the, the elementary school for potentially interest nor the middle school, but that can happen. And it's just where probably we need to get through the close of school and try to figure out um, how to, to put a small group that would start thinking about this since we have time. Um, and I never thought of it as being in the entryway, although someone said it would be nice for visitors to see, I always thought of this as being, as Shelley has described, as an interactive teaching way of teaching and incorporating into a curriculum. Um, so, so I don't think we need any more input right now, other than to hear we have a lot of possibilities in what's already in the works in terms of the building design, and then just trying to figure out who the IT people, there's also Rupert, a really active IT group at the middle school or the high school, you know, on trying to, um, the next book, breakthrough programmers, you know, on a, what are we trying to capture and how to make it look cool um, as long as it's, it's easy to understand. So so I, I think that's enough um, for what we've just had as this conversation. I'm happy to hear we're, we're metering at a level that we can, do what we might want to do with it. Bruce? Um, I agree with Jacob. Uh, uh, certainly, I agree with Jacob, absent a, a champion or, or a couple of champions, uh, which would be, say, um, among the uh, teachers within the, uh, the, the new school staff. Uh, but even with a champion, I think uh, Jacob's challenge to say, we've got a lot, let's, uh, let's, let's use it and just use it creatively and optimally. But the first thing, well, I should say, one thing that I would look for, just in, in my experience with these kind of things, is to look for a champion. Um, and we may not have one. Um, that's to say some teacher who cares deeply about this, who understands deeply about this, and who's not going to be moving on in a year to the greatest extent that you can predict that. If those, if one or two people like that exist on the staff, then we could perhaps make uh, some sort of thinking, but my guess is probably not, but certainly it would be wonderful to identify um, a champion or two as soon as possible. Great. Any last thoughts on this topic? Jonathan, are, is there any, are there any public attendees at the meeting? Yeah, there are. I, yeah, I was going to ask Kathy that. <laughs> Yeah, there are five people. So if I think we're at the point for public comments, Jonathan, I can well, you can ask them to, to indicate that they I want to. We are. Okay. So, uh, we will entertain uh, public comment. And Kathy will let you into the room. Okay, so I just brought Maria into the room. And we're uh, thank you so much. Um Maria Kapicki, South Amherst. First of all, um, uh, Kathy and Jonathan, you kept stealing my questions as I was listening. So thank you. Thank you. I thank everybody for all the work you're doing. Um, uh, I, I, I want to just make sure that um, Kathy's question about the equipment, if I understand it correctly, um, she was asking, have we um, decided to buy the best equipment that will give us that will do this and please forgive me if I am not getting everything right because I've been kind of multitasking and driving during this um so yes um, if that's what she was asking for to make sure we buy and employ the right equipment that would be great um and then also about the the PV so it sounds like the the additional the possible additional PV on the northern part of the parking lot has not been accounted for in the analysis that you've done so far because it's sort of a it's an unknown right now I guess is is and I'm just confirming that that's the case. Um, I did um, uh, want to ask and perhaps you talked about this. Has summer use um, 
and actually outside of school hour use has all of that been really accounted for because I can really imagine that this this building is it's it's going to be much desired by the community um, and by the school system for for uh, outside of the regular uh, calendar year. Um, really interested um, in, um, and this is where Jonathan stole me there to, to have, to, to say that the, the data that you're getting and whatever you can um, uh, get from this to involve, to, to, to be curricular is great. Not only though middle and high school students, and I'm sure there's going to be a science or math teacher um, interested in this, but um, I want to encourage you to also think about, you know, we're in uh, a college town. There are college students that would benefit from this. There are college professors who would love to, I think, incorporate this into their classes. There's a lot of community engagement that goes on. Um, and it's not necessarily entirely for this committee. If this is more uh, to bring back to the school building committee and encourage the folks in the schools to, to maybe do this. Um, but to get the idea of, of educators at all levels, and not only with energy use, but also there's a lot to learn here about hydrogeology. There's a lot to learn about architecture. So I think that this whole project is a wonderful opportunity for community engagement. And not for nothing, but to us, just regular adults would love to learn from this building as well into the future. So thank you so much for all of your hard work. I uh, really appreciate it. We have uh, Rudy. Hi, thanks. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, I went through the, going through the construction uh, uh, drawings and uh, one of the estimates, there were a number of items that I saw that looked like they would probably have been on Appendix A um but didn't seem to be listed and i just want to run through my list it's possible some of them are just so de minimis in use or so intermittent that you looked at that and you just figured that's not gonna have any impact or it's possible that some of these are already in the building systems energy as not plug load items but um if i could just i'm just going to run through the list and then i have a couple of questions if there's time uh, the undercounter ice maker in the nurse's office. I didn't see that in Appendix A. There's two undercounter refrigerators and a microwave in the nurse's office. I, I don't think I saw those. In the two staff lunchrooms, there's two full-size refrigerators that, based on the drawing, it looked like refrigerator freezers. Uh, I don't think those were in, in the Appendix A. Uh, there's also microwaves in each of those. And for a good measure, two coffee makers in each of the staff rooms as a coffee drinker. I can appreciate that. Um, I didn't see those in Appendix A. Uh, the administrative, the custodian's office also has a full-size refrigerator and a microwave. I didn't see those. Um, the administrative kitchenette has an undercounter refrigerator and a microwave. I didn't see those. And then the various interactive displays or digital message boards, I think we have three of them. I didn't see those listed. The classroom ones were listed, but I'm, you know, again, I might've missed these, but, and the gym has a bunch of motorized equipment. Maybe it's too intermittent to have any kind of impact, but it has six motorized uh, backboards. It has motorized bleachers. It has uh, two scoreboards and at $15,000 a pop, they better be electronic. Um, there are motorized retractable cargo nets in the gym. I guess that's, um, I don't know what those are for, but kids don't be bad in the gym. Um, and there's a motorized dividing curtain in the gym. There's also, I didn't see that on the list. There's a motorized curtain in the cafetorium and there's motorized projection screens in both the gym and the cafeteria. Um, the media center has a sound system, at least in the, one of the, I think that was in one of the estimates, and that doesn't seem to be listed. I thought we were doing hearing assistive technology in each classroom, but maybe that's gotten scrapped from the plans uh, over time. But if we're using those, probably I don't know how much energy they take, but I didn't see those in the classroom list. There's uh, motorized shades 
in nine locations. I didn't see those. Maybe that's in the building system. There's a treadmill in the ILC motor room. Um, there's also a swing, ceiling mounted swing. I don't know if that's powered or not. And possibly there's other ILC equipment that's powered that needs to be, I, again, I don't know the draw, maybe it's too intermittent, I don't know. Um, the toilets and sinks have sensor feeds and connections, so it doesn't appear to be battery operated. And that's 82 sensor feeds. I don't know the draw on those. And then there's hand dryers, um, 38 of them listed in the PMNC estimate. And I would imagine that those use a bit of power. Uh, and for good measure, there's two television sets listed. So um, I don't know, again, it's possible a lot of these are picked up in building system energy or are just too de minimis to fool with, um, but I just wanted to throw those out. And then do I have time for a couple of questions? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Um, the bottle fillers and drinking fountains are not chilled, I hope. Um, if they are, I think that's that would be a good place to cut. But I saw in the, the I think one of the uh, drawings, a couple of the drawings, electrical water coolers listed as an item. Now, maybe that's an HVAC item that I'm not thinking of how that comes into play, but, um, or maybe it's a leftover thing that, I'm just curious what that is. And hopefully we're not chilling too much water. Um, the, Induction range we've talked about. I'm curious why the kitchen has prep and serving counters that have so much electricity need. Like I, I've worked in a lot of different kitchens over the years in my youth and they usually were just stainless steel affairs. And I don't know what's being plugged in or whatever, but it might be worth just confirming that there's actually power needs on those. Um, the, there's both desktop printers and copier printers listed for each classroom. And I'm wondering if those are different, if we need both of those, I, I don't know. I don't know what the distinction is there. Um, and then we've got a lot of security cameras. I'm assuming those are taken off the power, the building system energy use, because uh, there's multiples of those. Um, was an elevator model chosen? I couldn't find that in the documents I had exercise, uh, access to. And I hope it has, or we at least looked at regenerative power elevators as a possibility. It might not be pr pr uh, practical here. Uh, just one small thing. There's an editor e editing error in uh, drawing 10.3.01 that still refers to incoming gas service. You might want to take that out at some point. And then for our EV uh, charging stations, I hope we're setting up our conduit so it could either be off the school or maybe better off a third party provider because um, that's going to blow right through our you know, EUI and our solar panels if we're powering a lot of car charging stations off, uh, off our power at the school. So I don't know, I don't know, we haven't really talked about that too much, but I hope we're thinking of multiple options. Maybe third party provider is not the best, maybe, well, that's a whole nother issue, but at some point it'll probably need to be talked about. So, and then Ashry recommended heating elements in the freezer floor so that you don't get frost heaving. I never thought of that before, but we're gonna have a lot of cold over a fairly high water table and, um, I hope we've either insulated it well or done something to, to prevent frost heaving. So um, thanks a lot. I do think we need, in the next project we do, we need to get into um, plug load use and energy budget right from the start, because it's very late in the day to be trying to find out alternative equipment or changing um, sharing patterns and so on and so forth. So thanks very much. Kathy, does anyone else have their, their hand up? No, that's it, Jonathan. Okay. Um, we don't usually uh, respond to comment, but I, I will say briefly that a summertime and hour use was was part of the uh, the review that was done. And and we can, Jonathan, we can repost that. We have yes, a grid. It's posted. It is posted, but we can just post it again. Yeah. Yeah. Bruce, parting thoughts. 
Yes. Well, actually, I know we have 20 minutes left if we run up to our hour. And uh, um, as usual, I'm impressed with Rudy's thoroughness. I mean, beyond all reasonable thoroughness. Um, and I wonder whether on Rudy's behalf, I can ask, um, because I'm used to getting really good answers from this crowd. Uh, and I don't think it's beyond uh, their capability to respond to generally to Rudy's observations that there appear to be uh, significant uh, classes and uh, numbers of things that are not on the plug loads. I would like to know whether Rudy's pointed out some things that are, have, have escaped the uh, vigilance of this entire crowd or whether they are taken care of in some ways or, as he said, in case of the gym, they are de minimis. If if uh, uh, if if uh, Tim or Rick or anyone can uh, enlighten me on this, I think Rudy's work deserves uh, a public response. Thank you. Um, I cannot give a complete answer because it was a somewhat lengthy list, but I've already started checking them. Um, I have discovered that a few of the items that he mentioned are in one of the cost estimates, uh, but they are with the note NIC next to them, which means not in contract. Uh, so they're actually not in the project. Though. Like a few of the, like the scoreboards and the motorized bleachers are, were somewhat surprising to me when he mentioned them. Uh, that being said, all of the other items, um, I can't really speak to on a piece of equipment by piece of equipment um, refrigerator, ice maker level without getting into the details. And perhaps Ali or Ermac have some I might encourage there. that um, that if possible, <laughs> if we get the list in an email, uh, and I think we could do a more thorough job um, in, in responding. That's a great suggestion. That would be really helpful. Kathy? Jonathan, that was exactly my mine. <laughs> and although Bruce said there's there's more time remaining. I have another meeting. So um, having a break between two meetings would be great. So I, I was say, you know, and, and I think it was a pretty long list. Um, yeah. And I imagine the answer is a combination of, of multiple things. That was a good start. I just wanted it to uh, know uh, to us to, to know that we are going to address this. And I know from responses that I've gotten from Tim and Rick and Ali and everybody uh, over the time so that I could expect this, but I, I wanted to be sure that everybody else knew as well. Thank you. Rudy, give us a list. That'll be great. Thanks. Yes, please. If there's nothing else, I would also like to adjourn early <laughs> by 15 or, or 17 minutes here. So um, hearing no objection, uh, I'm going to call the meeting complete. Thank you all. Thank you very much. And and I just want to thank the whole team for the amount of work you put very in. Very much so. So a uh, big thanks. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, all. Thank you. Thanks, all. Great.